Hello everyone and welcome to the Jesus College YouTube channel. My name is Sutiam and I'm just about to start my third year of medical school here at the University of Oxford. Since the deadline for medical school applications is not that far away, I thought some of you will be looking for more information regarding different medical schools around the country as well as their application processes. So I thought I would make a video about medicine at Oxford, sort of the course structure, the work-life balance, the exams, as well as the application process and some tips on your personal statement and also how to choose the college. Basically everything. So if you are thinking about applying for medicine at Oxford then please keep watching. Course structure is probably one of the most important factors to consider when deciding which universities to apply to for medicine. Medicine is a really long course so it's really important that you enjoy what you're learning and how you're learning it otherwise you're going to be stuck with a course that you're not going to enjoy for five to six years and the thing is we're all going to be doctors at the end no matter which university we go to so you may as well pick a course that you're going to enjoy doing and you're going to learn the best from. The course at Oxford is slightly different from many universities in the UK. As a quick summary, it's six years long and it's split into two three-year sections, preclinical medicine and clinical medicine. For the first five terms, you'll be focusing on the basic science behind medicine, things like physiology and pharmacology, embryology, infectious diseases, and so on. You will also be learning about how disruptions to the way the body usually functions can lead to disease. During this time, you won't have much patient contact, but you will be able to speak to patients with illnesses relating to the things that you have been learning twice a term. You will then reflect on these discussions with your GP tutor. Now, this part of the course is very essay heavy. You'll be expected to write about two essays a week, and these will each be around 1,000 to 1,500 words. And then these essays are marked by your tutors. You're expected to spend about five hours researching the essay title and about an hour writing it up. Though this does vary a lot and although tutors discourage it, most people will say that they spend far longer than this on each essay. You're also expected to spend a couple of hours preparing for each tutorial by reading around a topic of discussion. And given each tutorial is around an hour long, you'll be spending about 18 hours a week on tutorial work alone. This is on top of lectures and practicals, which can take about 17 hours a week, excluding any preparation you would have to do. You know, and I totally understand why this may put some people off. Medicine is an intense course at any university so why would you deliberately choose a university that expects you to spend even more time in the library but i personally think that this is about personal preference i thought that you know what i've learned so far is very valuable and so i think that the extra time i've spent doing all these essays has been worth it and i mean the purpose behind all these essays is to get you to a point where you can take a scientific article and analyze it really efficiently in an essay and they build you up to that so for the first three terms called bm1 you gather most of your information from textbooks and then for the fourth and fifth term called bm2 you move on to review papers and during your third year you basically spend most of your time reading and analyzing primary research papers i think this is a really good skill to have but i am someone who is interested in working both as a clinical doctor and as a medical researcher and if you're someone who only likes clinical medicine and cannot bear to put themselves through three years of essays, then you may very well disagree with me on this. Which is why I say it's really important that you like the course you're applying to, otherwise you can spend a long time forcing yourself to do the things you hate, and that can make you fall out of love with medicine. The most exciting aspect of preclinical medicine though is the final honour school or FHS. You will be able to take up a research project of your choice so you can choose the lab or it can be based in a hospital and you carry out the research yourself. You will have a supervisor who will guide you but you are supposed to do the experiments yourself and then you write it up as a scientific report. The project is supposed to be about eight weeks long and for someone like me who is super interested in medical research it is a really valuable experience. So the clinical years or your final three years are all about your hospital placements I haven't actually reached that stage yet, so I can't tell you much about it, but from people in the years above, I've been told that it's far more relaxed than the first three sort of preclinical years. You do have to stay in Oxford for longer though, so during your preclinical years, your terms are eight weeks long and you get to go home between each term, but you don't really get that during your clinical years because you're supposed to be in Oxford 
for basically all the year except maybe Christmas and a very short one or two weeks summer holiday but you know I've been told that you get like the evenings and the weekends all to yourself and you don't have to do that much work after you come home from your placement so pros and cons I guess So let's talk about exams because these are the things that you're going to be stressing the most about whilst you're at uni. Your first and second year exams consist of computer assessed multiple choice questions and lots of timed essays. Your third year exams determine the grade that you get for your medical sciences degree which you're awarded at the end of your preclinical studies. This consists of your project report and extended essay on any topic you like and a few timed essays but no multiple choice questions. So in third year you don't have a syllabus unlike first and second year you basically study what you want to study. Most of your time is spent reading primary research articles that you want to read. You basically have almost complete control over the content that you're learning which is really fun and it's really independent and that is the reason why you don't have multiple choice questions because everyone's learned different things. It's more about your analysis skills rather than the content that you've learned. From fourth year onwards, you are assessed by multiple choice questions and something called OSCEs. Now, OSCEs test your clinical skills. So you have actors there who are pretending to be patients and you're supposed to act as a doctor in that situation. So you might be given a CT scan and you're supposed to look at the CT scan and explain the result to the patient. But you also have an examiner next to the patient who is assessing your performance. So it is quite intense, or at least it feels like it's going to be intense. I haven't done one yet, but yeah. Now I've spent the past however many minutes talking about the intensity of the course at Oxford, but that does not mean you can't have a good work-life balance. I have a lot of fun in Oxford, obviously I study, but I also have fun, I also go out with my friends, I also go out to societies, so you can definitely do both, and it's important to do both because one, your mental well-being, and two, you want to be a well-rounded person, you know, a good doctor isn't someone who just looks at textbooks all day. See, the terms in Oxford are quite short, so no matter which subject you do, you're going to be spending quite a bit of time actually working. And this is the same for practically everyone who goes to Oxford to do an undergraduate degree. So a lot of the societies have to work a lot around um, sort of student schedules. And you find that actually a lot of the events that go on tend to be at times where you're not going to be working anyway. For example, I've recently started going to this ice hockey thing and that starts at like quarter past 10 and finishes at quarter past midnight. That's not going to be a time where you would be working anyway, unless you're in the middle of like an essay crisis. You shouldn't be working at that time anyway. So, you know, they sort of work around you. Society is sort of work around you because they know that the average Oxford student is probably going to be spending 2 p.m. working. So there is no point putting a society event on at 2 p.m. Some people even take up competitive university sports and still do well in medicine. Now with competitive university sports, you have to spend several times a week just training. You know, you're talking maybe eight hours a week of just training. That's really intense. I couldn't do it, not because of medicine, I just couldn't do it. But some people do do that as well as medicine. So you definitely do have time to do other things. You just have to have good time management skills, which shouldn't put you off because that's going to be a skill you'll be forced to develop once you start doing medicine anyway. I mean, the social life is great as well. Obviously we all go out with our friends, but actually I think like the sheer number of events that go on around you sort of encourage that quite a lot. So we have bops which are sort of parties organised by the junior common room in your college um, to be sort of run in college and you just pay like a small amount, like a fiver, and you get a lot of drinks for the night, which ends up really cost effective. You also have like really fancy balls where you're supposed to dress up and in like, in like maxi gowns and everything. You have a lot of things going on. You have crew dates, which are sort of these Oxford traditions where you go out with like your sports team and you play 
games where you're supposed to throw pennies in each other's drinks. So there's definitely a lot going on and there is definitely a lot of excuses to go out. Now with regards to sports, I hope I haven't put you off with the sort of university level training four times a week thing. You don't have to do that. That's not the only sort of sports option that's available to you. You can do sort of university sports that are not competitive. You can also do college sports and have competitions with other colleges. And those are usually not that competitive either, probably with the exception of rowing. So you have a lot of options. Now, rowing is a really huge thing here, and it's probably the biggest sports that we have in Oxford. And the one good thing about it is that pretty much no one has ever rowed before they come to Oxford. So when you start out rowing in Oxford, everyone's pretty much starting from scratch, which means that you have a pretty good chance of getting to a competitive level if you want to. It's not like football where you already have to be super good at it before you come to uni to ever have a chance of being, you know, picked into the first team or whatever so it really does have that advantage and a lot of my friends do it I don't do it because you have to wake up at like 5 a.m and I can't I can't do that but if you are interested in doing that then it sounds really fun and it's a really good opportunity to make new friends too so now I want to move on to the application process for medicine at Oxford And first, I wanted to talk about the shortlisting process because there's been a really important change in how it's done recently. When I made my application, you were shortlisted 50% based on contextualised GCSEs and 50% based on your BMAT results. And the applications of everyone who hadn't made the shortlist based on their GCSEs and BMAT would have then been reviewed by tutors who would look for evidence of mitigating circumstances. And if such evidence was present and the tutors believed that that particular student had underperformed because of those circumstances, then they would have been added to the shortlist after the sort of initial algorithmic round. But this system has changed for you guys. GCSEs are no longer used for the initial shortlisting stage. It has all been replaced with contextualised BMAT. For this reason, it is really important that you put in any mitigation circumstances that you have in your personal statement, otherwise tutors can't see them. So it doesn't matter if it happened at school or if it happened at home. If you believe it has affected your exam performance, then please put it in because it's really important that tutors do see them and what you don't want is effectively to miss out on the opportunity to be interviewed based on something that was out of your control. So please do put it in. There is a really good resource for personal statements for medical school on the Oxford website, which I've linked down below. And really, probably the most important part of your personal statement is showing motivation. You don't want to just be listing all the things that you've read or done in life. You want to be demonstrating that you really, really, really care about medicine and that it's your calling in life and it's the one thing that you really, really, really want to do. And you can't really demonstrate that sort of passion by simply listing all the books that you've ever read that relate to medicine. You need to actually demonstrate that you have a passion for the content of the books, for example. So you need to actually draw in examples from the book and discuss them in your personal statement. You need to show initiative to show passion. So maybe talk about how one particular book that you read inspired you to carry out extra research in a particular topic that relates to medicine. It is totally okay to be really geeky in your personal statement because that's sort of what they're looking for. I mean, they want someone who is really fascinated by medicine. So actually show your geeky side in your personal statement and talk about the science, talk about what you've learned and talk about all the extra things that it inspired you to do. You also need to demonstrate that you understand exactly what a career in medicine involves and aren't necessarily falling in love with a glamorized version of it. What you really want to be doing is showcasing that you understand that medicine does have a lot of downsides you'll be working very long hours it will be very it will be a very tough job but that despite these downsides you find it quite rewarding and you know you'd still want to work in medicine and remember you do need to be talking about the basic science underpinning medicine as well as the human and patient side of medicine so you want to be showing empathy and you also be wanting to show sort of 
analytical skills in your personal statement. You want to be showing that you are really good at both because that's what a good doctor is, someone who is really good at medicine and someone who is really good with patients. But most of all, you just need to be sincere and just be yourself, you know, make sure that your personal statement is in your own writing style. You don't have to force anything. You don't have to make it super duper academic and use a thesaurus for every single word that you use in your personal statement. Make sure that it's you because they actually quite like diversity in personal statements. No one wants to be reading, you know, robotic pieces of work over and over and over again. So make sure that it's you, make sure that it's sincere. Don't lie in your personal statement because they can pick it up in interviews. And if that happens, then it'll be game over. They'll say you're not fit enough to be a doctor. So yeah, that's it. Now, choosing a college. I think a lot of people stress unnecessarily when it comes to choosing a college. For some reason, and I think it's partially because all sort of shortlisted candidates are interviewed at two colleges, many sort of um, medical students don't even end up in the colleges that they originally applied for. So I wouldn't worry about it too much because there's no guarantee that you'll end up in the college that you applied to anyway. I made an open application, so I didn't really consider any of these factors myself. But looking back, I would say that the location of the college, the size of the college and whether it can provide you with accommodation for all the six years are some of the things that you need to be looking at when you're deciding which college to apply to. So I go to Jesus and we're considered a smaller college and I definitely say that we're closer to each other than some of the bigger colleges. We have more friendships forming between the year groups, for example, and I know basically everyone in my own year group. So there's definitely more of a close-knit community going on in our college. Big colleges have more students though, so you have more people you can make friends with. Saying that as medical students, a lot of the teaching is centralized and you'll be spending quite a lot of time outside of your college and you'll meet people at lectures and sort of seminars anyway. So you'll have a lot of opportunity to make friends with people from other colleges. And you'll be meeting people from other colleges at society events as well. So you basically have a chance to be friends with anyone who goes to Oxford, regardless of the college that they attend. It's just that a lot of your social events tend to be sort of college centered. For example, your bobs and your, your balls, which tend to be sort of less expensive if you are a member of that college. I prefer being in a smaller college but you know it's one of those things that again is down to personal preference. Accommodation is really important as well. Jesus thankfully does provide accommodation for all six years though many medical students choose to rent privately in their fifth and sixth year just for you know independence and also because their friends doing other subjects have already graduated by then so it's the perfect time to effectively move out. One important factor which is understated is bursary provision. Some colleges give more bursaries than others. I would say Jesus is really good in this regard. It has pretty good bursaries and also gives you funds for internships and travel. Though there are really good central funds with the big one being Crankstart. So overall, I would say that the college you end up at doesn't really matter that much. Most people love the colleges that they attend. And if you find yourself stressing over which college to apply to, I would simply just apply to Jesus. <laughs> or you can make an open application, up to you. The point is, almost everyone at every college is super lovely and you'll have a great time anywhere. So thank you all for watching. 